Hi everyone, and welcome to Two Writers Talking, The World of Birds with David Allen Sibley, Richard O. Prum, and J. Drew Lanham. A bit of a holy trinity in the ornithology universe tonight. My name is Jillian Brillia with Doubleday, and I have just a few housekeeping items to touch on before I turn things over to tonight's fantastic speakers. And I'm sure many of you are already Zoom experts, but we have quite a large audience tonight, so I'm just gonna cover some of the basics. If you'd like to submit questions for our speakers, you can do so by utilizing the Q&A module, which should be available at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions submitted by others. You can activate the Zoom chat, which should also be at the bottom of your screen, and it's quite active tonight, and comment along with the conversation. We would suggest toggling your chat from all panelists, which is the default, to all panelists and attendees. This will make your comments available to the whole group. Now I'm going to ask David, Rick, and Drew to start their microphones and cameras and come on to the digital stage. While our speakers are getting settled, I'll mention that moderating the event tonight is J. Drew Lanham, alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at Clemson University. He's a cultural and conservation ornithologist whose work addresses the confluence of race, place, and nature. Drew is the poet laureate of Edgefield County, South Carolina, and the author of Sparrow Envy Poems, Sparrow Envy, A Field Guide to Birds and Lesser Beasts, and The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, which was the winner of the Reed Environmental Writing Award, the Southern Book Prize, and a 2017 finalist for the Burroughs Medal. It was most recently named Memoir and Scholarly Book of the Decade. His creative writing and opinion appears in Orion, Vanity Fair, Oxford American, High Country News, Bitter Southerner, Terrain, Places Journal, Literary Hub, Newsweek, Slate, NPR, StoryCorps, Threshold Podcast, Audubon, Sierra Magazine, This Is Love Podcast, and The New York Times, among others. Drew is a lifelong bird watcher and hunter conservationist currently living in Seneca, South Carolina. We have such a special event tonight for all of you. And with all that out of the way, I'll now turn things over to Drew. Thank you so much, Jillian. And thank you to all of you for, for being here or there or in um, this virtual ethosphere with us tonight, I'd like to introduce you to the two luminaries in the bird world. First, I'll go to, to Richard, Richard Prum, who is the William Robertson Co-Professor of Ornithology and Head Curator of Vertebrate Zoology at the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale University, grew up in rural Vermont. He's an evolutionary ornithologist with broad interests in a wide array of topics, as you'll see, that include phylogenetics and behavior, the feathers work in structural uh, coloration, evolution, development, and sexual selection. Um, quite a tongue-twisting array of things that, that Rick does, and he's expert at all of them. He earned his bachelor's degree at Harvard in 1983 and received his PhD in 1989 from the University of Michigan. Now, Rick's done extensive field work all over the world and conducts research on plumage pigmentation, feather evolution, and Darwin's sexual selection theory, which is not controversial at all. And Rick just helps us settle all of that. He released a book, in fact, in 2017 on the role of beauty in natural selection called The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choice Shapes the Animal World and Us. His book was named one of the 10 best books of 2017 by the New York Times, and Rick has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and is a MacArthur Fellow. I think it's safe to say that Rick watches the intimate lives of birds with an intensity that few of us could ever match. Our next guest tonight is David Allen Sibley of Plattsburgh, New York, and is perhaps known best as the author and illustrator of a Sibley, The Sibley Guide to Birds, really a game-changing publication and one of the most comprehensive guides for North American birds. Now, I've worn the virtual pages of my Sibley Guide flat out, um, but my shelves are full of Sibley Guides. David got his start as a bird watcher at one of the meccas of birding, that is Cape uh, May Point in New Jersey, and was later inspired to create and illustrate his own field guides to go beyond confusing fall warblers to think about the alternate and juvenile plumages of birds. Also an amazing award winner, 
David won the Roger Tory Peterson Award from the American Birding Association for Lifetime Achievement in Promoting the Cause of Birding. And in 2006, he was awarded the Linnaean Society of New York's Eisenman Medal. Now again, David is here with us virtually, but for many of us, he's all over our shelves. I won't go down his extensive list of field guides, but suffice it to say, there's almost no bird or tree that you can identify with a Sibley guide. So without further ado, I think we're gonna take our bird brains and, and, and perch for a while and think about some of these, these complex issues, but really, Rick and David, I'd like to boil this down and come back a bit to why it is that we are who we are, why we're addicted to birds. So I thought we'd talk a bit about beauty through the lens of both science and art, and then maybe um, have you talk a bit about the convergence of, of the data that, that you collect as scientists and observers, and then the images, which are also data that you paint so beautifully, David, and, and how this convergence of science and art really helps us think about not only our love for feathered things, but maybe also about their protection, and maybe we'll uh, ease a little bit over into how birds impact our lives in so many ways. So I, I'll start off with a question for you. Um, Feather fascination is obviously the, the basis for when he, what any of us do. It's sort of the egg that, that we've all hatched from. So what do we make of beauty? Uh, I mean, in, in thinking about what it is, what defines beauty? Who defines it? Is my beautiful, your pretty? Can we settle on cute between the two? So... Um, can, can you tell me what's what's beautiful in a bird for each of you? David, I'll, I'll let you you go first. Yeah, um, that is a <laughs> that is a deep question. <laughs> but I, you know, as I am watching birds and drawing birds, really thinking deeply about what they look like and trying to understand what they look like to to translate that onto into lines on paper. Um, I always come back to form. It's the, for me, the beauty is really in the, the form, the shape, the, um, and they're so, um, just so exquisitely adapted to their environment. When you see something like a, a peregrine falcon, a golden plover, these birds that fly at high speed, long distances, that everything about them is, is adapted to high speed flight. Their lines are so smooth and and streamlined, and um, that uh, I always come back to that as the kind of the fundamental beauty of birds is just these gorgeous shapes that fit so perfectly in their environment. Wow! Yeah, it's 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 deep, Rick, and 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 David um, hinted at form and function and evolution and all that stuff. So what do you, what's beautiful? Well, of course, there's, a, there's the beauty to me, right? As a, as a, as a originally a birder and now, a, a, you know, an evolutionary biologist and ornithologist. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, that motivating uh, attachment that just keeps you curious mm -hmm. and gets you out on a rainy day in hopes of seeing this or that or um, uh, you know, it's that, it's that, it's that engagement, uh, you know, birds are animals with a lot of differences from what we expect, their feathers, their flight, their postures, their activity, their, their songs. And obviously for, for me early on, it was a lot of song, but scientifically, a lot of my research has gone in the direction of, of, of studying, um, the beauty of birds as a scientific idea. And, uh, and really dedicated to the idea that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves and that they're agents in their own evolution through their own sexual and social choices. And so, you know, we have an opinion, but they have their own, uh, you know, 10,000 opinions, uh, different species of what are, what are, uh, what beauty is all about. And that radiation of beauty in their own sense is, is a, a you know, a, 
profoundly uh, motivating scientific and, uh, and personal idea. Well, that, that whole idea of the aesthetic, right? And I mean, in something somehow being attractive to us, but then that question of, and what we see and, and what we perceive, and I'm, and I'm looking over David's shoulder and I see a painted bunting and a, and a black throated green warbler. And, I, and, and there's a question that I'm sure you've both been asked, Rick and, and David, of, of your favorite bird, but I'm gonna twist that a little bit early on. And I'm gonna need your three top beautiful birds. So on all the lists that birders can have, um, do you, are there birds that just strike you silly every time you, you see them? What are the, what, what birds sort of form that list of, of most beautiful for you, Rick? Well, uh, first off, I mean, picking your favorite or most beautiful bird is like, uh, as, a, as a parent, I, I think that question is like, you know, you know, pick a favorite child. It's just, you can't go there, right? You know, in some way. So, but there are birds that for me are special. And these are ones that I've, that I've uh, studied in the field uh, that I have spent a lot of time looking for. Uh, and searching out and trying to find out something about them. And, and in this case, a lot of them have been courtship displays. So uh, there are mannequins like the golden wing mannequin found in, um, in the Andes. Um, the velvet acidi, which is a bird in Madagascar that is wow. deeply black with this uh, outrageously fluorescent green caruncle with a little blue stripe in the middle. Uh, these are both uh, you know, aesthetically extraordinary birds. And then, and then there's another way to be special, and that is, um, you know, that uh, that personal birding experience, right? And um, when I was a kid in Manchester, Vermont, uh, a local birder found a, a, a Lawrence's warbler, and mm -hmm. I got a call, at, you know, six thirty in the morning some day, and from a friend, Tom Will, and he said, "We got to go see this bird, Ricky." And I was in seventh grade, and I told my mom. I can't go to school. I've got to go see Lawrence's Warbler. It's like, what is this? Well, it's a, it's a hybrid. It is the double recessive. And he's like, okay, okay, you could skip school today to go see the Lawrence's Warbler. So, so that's where I've never seen that bird again. Um, and yet, you know, that, 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 that experience puts it in a whole nother level. So as birders, we all know that those uh, details add, add to the meaningfulness of, of, of birding and, uh, and, uh, and to me, the, the, the science of it. Beautiful. How about you? Do you have a, I mean, as a painter, I mean, who, what uh, do you decide to pin up, you know? Yeah, it's like Rick said, it's just, it's impossible to pick just three or it's impossible to pick any. And, and a lot of it for me, I think a lot of it depends on the, the circumstances that, I mean, any bird, um, I always say, I mean, half jokingly that well, not jokingly at all, actually, <laughs> seriously, that I'm happy looking at pigeons. I can sit on a park bench and watch the pigeons walking around and they're, they're just gorgeous. They're the subtle shadings of gray, blue gray, a little lavender on the neck. Um, the structure of their feathers is, is interesting. It's kind of, um, they look kind of striated when you look very closely. Anyway, that's so. Uh, there are times when I can look at a pigeon and think that's that's a gorgeous bird. Um, but um, I'm thinking about my my three choices, and I'll start with one that many many birders would put on their list, which is swallow-tailed kite. That just every time I see a swallow-tailed kite, it just blows me away. I could watch them for hours, flying. They're just so graceful. Um, and then. Uh, I'll say um, for a, a, a dark horse, a more obscure pick, a Leconte Sparrow is just a spectacularly beautiful bird that kind of straw yellow and purple gray um, and such intricate patterns. Um, a really good close look at a Leconte Sparrow is, is uh, something that I think anybody would would look at that bird and say, that's a gorgeous bird. Um, and along the same lines, I would pick any, any really fresh plumaged young shorebird, the, the juveniles when they've just started their fall migration. And they're similar to the Leconte Sparrow, but something like a, a juvenile lesser yellow legs. 
it's it's just shades of gray with with patterns of white dots, whitish dots and bars and but that um, the whole thing together, the the way all the feathers fit together, the feathers are all fresh and new and perfectly arranged and these subtle shadings of soft gray and buff and white and that, that any of those um, fresh plumage fall shorebirds, just gorgeous. Well, I, you know, I can't disagree with, with, with either of you really. And, and the whole idea of these, I mean, I don't know what a box of Crayolas, how many colors, how many hues it would be. Um, uncountable really when we think about the diversity there, but then we think, I mean, this is how we see, you know, with, with our rods and our cones and how birds maybe are seeing one another is, is totally different than, than how we're perceiving them. And as I, I have read both of you and, and think about what you do, um, there is some blurring of the lines that, that come in. I mean, here, Rick, you've talked about the evolution of, um, of, of, mating, of mating choice. And, and David, here, you've talked about what's it like to be a bird. So, you know, Rick, you began to drift into some pretty controversial areas of, of humanness sort of beyond birds. And David, here you are doing what many of us grew up doing. I mean, I wanted to be every other bird that I saw, I thought I could be that bird. So this blurring of the lines between us and birds and sort of this wonder, I'd like for you to talk about that a little bit since we're talking about convergence and how things come together, what it, it means to you to have those lines blurred or not blurred. David? Um, yeah, it's, you know, for me, the, as I worked on the, my, my most recent book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, I was just, just trying to answer a lot of the common questions that I hear about birds or questions that I had about birds. And, and um, the, the research was leading me to so many fascinating um, discoveries, <laughs> things that, are, <laughs> that were already known, but not, not known to me. And, and Rick's research figured prominently in several aspects of that, of my, my studies for that book. Um, and, you know, it just, I, I kept thinking about all the, there's so many ways birds are very different from us, that their vision is very different. Um, as you alluded to, they, they, a lot of species can see ultraviolet light. So for example, male and female chickadees look alike to us, but the, the males apparently have a bright ultraviolet reflection from their, their cheeks, what we see as mm -hmm. white. So the, to the other chickadees, it's very obvious which ones are males. Um, that's just one little example of how they see each other differently, but in a lot of ways also um, there are similarities. And I, um, you know, as Rick's, Rick's book, The Evolution of Beauty, um, is making a very strong case for the fact that the birds are making, are choosing mates based on their appearance. And, and, uh, that there's a sense of beauty behind that. Um, I'm always impressed by how much that seems to overlap with our own <laughs> sense of beauty, that the female wood ducks are choosing males that look spectacular to us. And that's uh, just a kind of mind boggling sort of convergence that the bird's sense of beauty um, must have a lot of similarities to our own. Yeah, that's that's certainly some blurring there. And I mean, Rick, from the the point of view of a, of an evolutionary ecologist here, I mean, can you can you talk about this this whole idea of perception of beauty for beauty's sake? Yeah. Well, I you know, first of all, my my my. Uh, my take in, in ornithology has always been to, to, and coming from my bird watching roots, is uh, to take birds seriously, right? <laughs> on their own, on their own, on their own, on their own, uh, uh, in their own way. And um, 
and that's led to all sorts of blurring between you know science of ornithology and other areas and, and aesthetics is, is one of them and, and so a lot of scientists responded to, to, to the evolution of beauty by saying, well, well, you know, why do you have to use that word? Yeah, I mean, why don't you choose, uh, you know, we understand attraction. Why, why are you causing problems? And, and, and um, because I, one, because on the scientific side, I think we need some stirring up. Uh, you know, anthropomorphism is not really a scientific problem as it was once. It, it's really a way to police us, to prevent us doing science on the subjective experience of animals, you know, taking them seriously. So, um, uh, so I've enjoyed blurring these lines between, you know, strict science and, and, uh, and things that are not science, uh, because I think it works. I think it works for us to understand uh, both birds and ourselves better in that way. Um, now in, 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 in science, you know, most of my colleagues in evolutionary biology believe that ornaments like the wood thrush song or the plumage of that, of that, uh, that lovely painted bunning have evolved because they indicate information about quality. And this is a way of taking beauty and making it, flattening it into a, a practical tool, you know, a way of getting better. And one of, the, one of the things I've tried to revive in my work is the Darwinian idea that it's really about um, what animals like and that what it is they like uh, is dynamic, evolving in different species from common ancestry and radiating. So what we see in the birds is not just adaptive radiation, but aesthetic radiations. And that those aesthetic radiations can often be elaborated in ways that are, that are not about uh, being better, uh, getting better, but are about uh, you know, subjective uh, desire and experience, right? So um, all of this makes um, our science kind of, uh, what, uh, uh, f fuzzy on the edges. And what I think we have to do is get comfortable with that because in order to actually study nature, we need to um, uh, take, take animals seriously. Wow, yeah, I, you know, this, this, this blurring, this fuzzying that, um, I mean, as birders, you know, we spend a lot of time, I mean, whether it's counting wing bars or, or, or thinking about these shades of gray, literally, um, there's a certain amount of comfort, I think, for me that comes sometimes in not knowing the answer. And if, certainly for scientists, it's, it's job security because it's more for us to do, it's more for us to study. And so sometimes giving up on that impid <laughs> that's, that's not singing in the fall um, with, with this confusing plumage leads us to want to know more. And so I, I think about your blurring and I think about the art of the science and, and the science and the art that you both do, that's, that's pretty incredible. I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to think, for us to think for a moment about how what you do has advanced, if we can use that word, birding, bird watching, which I would ask, maybe those are two different things, but then our protection of birds ultimately, and, and how we kind of selfishly have more birds around for us to watch and to marvel over and to wonder over. So, so David, what's, what's your take on, on how your art maybe has helped birds in our perceptions of them going going forward. Um, yeah, I think everything that I've, all of my work has been um, with the the purpose of trying to sort of introduce people to birds, um, and it's. Um, I guess in mean, all of my books have been very personal projects in a way. I, I've tried to just do to create the books that I wanted myself. Um, mm. And bird watching is, it's, it requires a tremendous amount of information. It's really all about information and learning and, and uh, acquiring understanding. And um, uh, so if you, if someone develops an interest in birds, they need a lot of information, a lot of, um, guidance along the way to to be able to understand that world and um so that's that's been the kind of the focus of all of my work and and it's really for myself understanding understanding birds better and understanding the 
the broader patterns. Um, I would say that in the in this discussion of sort of art and beauty and science and the convergence that the the I think a big part of bird watching is is the um, um, the pleasure of of seeing and understanding the patterns of nature and and putting names on the species um, then uh, and identifying different ages and sexes different subspecies um, the patterns of occurrence through the seasons of each species their habitat preferences all of these things are sort of overlapping circles sets and subsets of of traits and and behaviors and um, as you get into birding you start to understand those patterns and I and they link up to all kinds of other patterns in nature and there's kind of a nice comforting rhythm to all of it and once you start to understand some of the patterns you can predict some things and and they become familiar and accessible and and part of your part of your own sort of circle of understanding um, and uh, so I guess that's a long, complex <laughs> explanation of how um, I think introducing people to birds through a field guide, just through just giving them a name to attach to a bird that that puts it in its place and it sort of puts a pin in it on the on the map, and uh, and is the beginning of understanding all of those patterns, which leads to an understanding of the whole natural world and all of the cycles and and the value and and our own place in that whole uh, natural world so um, perspective and accessibility in a way cool yeah rick what do you, what do you think man well uh david referred to you know all the technical uh knowledge and technical detail the background information that's required to 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 to, to, to bird watch and uh you know, one of the things I've aspired to, or I would do aspire to, is is um, uh, sort of creating a kind of deep birding, if you will, right? Uh, so that when you're observing the species or experiencing it, you're 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 also um, uh, referencing some of the more of the biology and, and the detail. So if that means, wow, you know, that blue beak on that ruddy duck is actually uh, light scattering off of parallel collagen fibers. <laughs> and it's one of the only birds that regrows a structural collar annually, you know, back and forth, right? You know, uh, or, and you know, you could just go on and on, uh, you know, what's required uh, to create the, the, the plumage on uh, a California quail or a Montezuma quail, An extraordinary complexity, right? Um, uh, or and song, right? What's going on respiratory and functionally in a syrinx to create a complex bird song? Uh, even a Henslow sparrow, right? Uh, you know the uh, that depth, or you know, um, uh, what's what's the bird I could see that would be the longest branch on the avian phylogeny? You know that Hawatson is the bird most distantly related to any other living bird. Now that, that that's a way of looking at listing that I think is also uh, I think actually I'd, I'd love for uh, eBird uh, when you input any list by reference to the phylogeny to give you a phylogenetic weight of the, the phylogenetic diversity of the things in that list. And you know once we do that, we'd actually could do research because. Uh, there is a lot of interest in, in phylogenetic disparity of birds that live in one place or live in a in, 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 or can be seen in a day, right? So uh, this is a way of like uh, adding depth to the appreciation of the, of the birds we see. And unfortunately, science is kind of isolated from the experience of a lot of people. And so, you know, uh, writing is one way to try to uh, break down those barriers and get more of that information out to the world. And I think uh, David's book, uh, what is it like to be a bird? It's just a marvelous case of that. Every page has uh, fascinating, it's an ornithology textbook uh, for birders, right? And with reference, you know, by species and topics, right? And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually, it would have been the perfect book when I was 12. I would, I think I would have <laughs> worn it, its covers off. And, uh, and I hope that, I know there's people out there who uh, will do the same. 
Well, thank I, you. you know, that, that whole idea, again, of blurring and convergence and, and how all of this come together. And Rick, I love that idea of deep birding. And I've, I've, I've sort of taken myself back to bird watching because there's this intensity that develops and especially during this pandemic and we've been quarantined, um, we may have, have had to pay more attention to pigeons, David, um, and as they fly through concrete canyons or recognize the amazing variation in cardinals that come to our backyard, that they indeed are different um, and behaving differently. So that whole idea of deep birding and this whole idea of beauty and what we see and how we see it Rick, you mentioned earlier sort of this, this idea of experience. And I asked you for a list earlier, but now can you paint sort of the last scene that sort of, that sticks with you from some birding trip, some expedition far away, or maybe something close to home, some encounter? Well. So, so very, very close to home uh, of last week for five minutes, twice in one afternoon, I had a female evening grow speak at the feeder in my house wow. and uh, I didn't get any work done the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was sitting in the kitchen pretending to work right well, just, is that, is that it again? And, uh, <laughs> you know, and a, a, a couple of people came by to see if they could pick it up. So this is a, you know, uh, evening grow speak was actually probably in my first 25 birds when I was a kid in Vermont, we used to take the picnic table, bring it up around side the living room window and throw sunflower seed and flocks <laughs> of 30 of them would come down. That was in the you know early 70s and uh, they're a lot rare now. And But this is a great year in New England for them. And so that was my first time in 15 years in Connecticut for seeing uh, even growth speak in, in the state. Uh, they tend to sort of like just fly through and other feeders got it, but I'm mine. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's like seeing an old friend and, and, uh, and, and then in the, have it in the backyard and they know that, that uh, um, I've gotten probably less work done in the last week too, because <laughs> of that, of that uh, the possibility might come back. So Since you don't, you don't way, have to, you don't have to go to an exotic locale, you know, it, it happens, uh, happens uh, everywhere. Yeah. Birds, you can time travel millions of years or, or yeah. Yeah. certainly. So thank you for that. David, how about you? Yeah, I'm, I've always enjoyed um, birding close to home and the birds that are, that are in front of me in the moment. So the, this pandemic shutdown hasn't really <laughs> changed my birding all that much. I walk out the back door. We're lucky to live in a place where I can just walk out the back door and, and walk around and look at birds. But um, I'm, you know, I'm always um, thinking about questions about bird the variation, vocalizations, and it's been, I've really enjoyed this, this year of sort of forced, um, forced non-travel to, um, to really get to know the birds right here around home and um, to, to be here through the entire summer, spring, summer, fall, and, and pay attention to the changes in the vocalizations, um, the changes in, in behavior and plumages. Um, and um, one, one example specifically that I'll mention is, um, well, there's so, there's so many, but um, American woodcock, we have a, a few right here around the house that display regularly and and for months from March through May they're displaying every dawn and dusk and on uh, full moon nights they they go on into the night um, and they've continued into the fall they took a break in the summer um, there was no display and then starting in um, September October there was some display again but it's sort of a like a sub song a practice display in the same way that a songbird, young songbirds in the fall will sing a sort of primitive, un, unpracticed version of the adult song. Um, these woodcocks seem to be doing, they do a partial display or they do a, a display that was a little bit slower and less less precise, less, chore less um, sort of uh, 
yeah, less precise than the displays mm -hmm. you hear in the spring. So in that that section at the end where they're doing the the sort of zigzag um, dropping down, sweeping back and forth, and, and long <laughs> yes, there you go. yeah, that was it was slower and and um, didn't have much of a rhythm to it. it it's sort of a uh, you know, instead of the that they do in the spring, it was a <laughs> and I imagine it was young, young male woodcock practicing. Um, but anyway, that's there's been so many discoveries for me like that. Just, just, and mostly new questions. <laughs> that, as as you alluded to earlier, there is no end of questions, and and no end of uh, of work for the the business of being a, a scientist birder um, investigator it, it's you can learn things in your own backyard um, just by looking looking carefully and asking questions that's that's so beautiful and I you know as I as we're separated virtually and and um, and for safety reasons but sitting here looking at the screen and I'm watching and listening to both of you and and it, this is all arcing, you know, this is all left brain, right brain arcing between the science um, and the art and, and to, to have the art inform the science and then have the science inform the art, um, I think is, is one of the values of, of watching birds, of, of absorbing them and that there is some deeper relationship that, that we have. I, I imagine that um, certainly, there there are there are primates even now, not Homo sapiens sapiens that that look up and and think something about birds or hear bird songs in, in ways maybe that that we don't. And so here we are talking about these convergences. What are you up to now? I know we we're here talking about the evolution of beauty and talking about what it's like to be a bird, but what's on the burner for you guys now? What are you working on that's 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 exciting you that we can look forward to to moving us deeper into into birds rick well um i, I have uh, awesome excellent students and postdocs in my lab and so we've got some normal science going on and <laughs> trying to maintain that and uh undergraduate uh, research projects as well, trying to get those to scientific publications. So, so that, that that that's ongoing. Lot, lots of interesting stuff, and, and of course, uh, um, it's sort of a, a, an avalanche of, of <laughs> backlog of science I should have been writing. Um, I'm working on an odd little book that is basically uh, genetics and uh, and uh, uh, feminist uh, and queer theory. Uh, uh, that's going to be uh, just a little bit of ornithology, <laughs> and then I'm re I'm really interested in in a, a kind of a, a natural history of of uh, of, uh, of beauty, if you will, uh, the media and genre in avian uh, aesthetics, and so um, that's a project that's also uh, moving along too. So uh, um, uh, lots of areas and uh, lots of of, of uh, you know science and uh, stuff that's not science. Awesome. What about you, David? Um, yeah, lots of things. Also, I've been kind of dabbling in different projects and, and waiting for something to really take hold for a, a next book. But I'm, I'm working a lot on a revision of the bird guide or towards, towards a revision of the bird guide um, and the bird guide app, which I can update regularly. I have a lot of uh, material ready to go into that. And it's, um, it's always you know, there are there are a hundred different projects I'd like to do. And it's a challenge to sure. figure out which one. And um, one that I mean, Rick and I talked about this a couple of years ago when I was working on what it's like to be a bird. I asked him about his his research on hummingbird structural the structural color of hummingbird throat feathers. And um, I'm I, I, you've probably seen in the book I had to greatly simplify that to make to fit it into a paragraph in the book Rick so uh, <laughs> I'm really I would love to get back to that as a as a little mini project just to try to I still don't understand it I have to confess 
Yeah, well, I, <laughs> maybe we should collaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to do some some illustrations. And, 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 to try and why to... are why are albino bluebirds white instead of if it's a you know structural color? You know, what's the function of yeah. melanin in 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 a bluebird, even though it's not you know uh, uh, part of the color? It's yeah, it's, it's another function, right? So that, that... Yeah. But that's, you know, uh, that's my yeah, many, many, many little projects. And uh, well, da da David should be sleeping late because he just produced a marvelous book, which <laughs> takes an enormous <laughs> amount of effort. Right. And uh, uh, so uh, he's uh, he's earned uh, a uh, a season of birding in his a backyard little, for sure. A little bit of a rest, huh? I mean, yeah. it's I'm I'm it's to sit between the two of you and, and to to have to have read you and to, to have used you in the field and, and sort of the way, and David, you're, you're mostly on my phone now, even though my, my guide is still in my, in my truck, you know, I can pull up my guide there, but again, to, to be able to sit between this arcing of art and science um, is a beautiful thing. So I'm grateful to both of you for the expansion that you give us through birds. And I, I think that birds are an ultimate expression, yes, of themselves, and these, these evolutionary lineages, but they're also expressions of human aspiration, really, in, in ways that you both have done beautiful jobs of depicting, but also of, of giving us these questions. So we're gonna take some questions now, okay, from our, our listening audience um, who are there watching, who are perched patiently. Um, and uh, like mannequins maybe, Rick, I don't know, <laughs> um, watching us so um jillian if you can um throw us some questions maybe then then we'll begin to um begin to go but i'm gonna i'm gonna start off and um we've got a question uh from freya asks is there a specific behavior that one or more bird species engages in that particularly fascinates you and why does it intrigue you so much rick well, um, I'd have to say singing and song. Of course, that's a huge and broad area. Um, but, you know, uh, birds are unique in how they sing. Uh, we, uh, all other vertebrates, except maybe whales, vocalize with a larynx, right? And the larynx evolved from some gill arches, things that used to hold up our gills, right? <laughs> and, but for birds, the larynx, the hyoid becomes part of the tongue. So uh, birds were evolutionarily silenced, right? They got rid of the larynx for feeding purposes. And then they came up with a whole new thing, the syrinx. And um, the syrinx is, uh, you know, lots of research going on, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing, uh, complicated mystery how they managed to put, and just imagine, you know, a winter wren uh, sit on your finger, weigh much less than a nickel maybe, and uh, can produce a song that can be heard at a hundred yards uh, with a little syrinx that's, uh, you know, like a tiny little piece of linguine, you know, it, it, how does that work? Uh, there's no technology <laughs> on the planet that, that we have that can do that. Uh, and uh, uh, it's marvelous. And so um, um, I'd have to put song in that category. How about you, David? Is there a is there a, a behavior that fascinates you? Yeah, if I'll, I'll go uh, broad also and just say migration is. Mm. Uh, I've always always been fascinated by migration, and um, when I was young, um, my father is an ornithologist, and and so I had opportunities to to do all kinds of things with him when I was a kid, and and we went on a trip to Ecuador when I was. 15 years old um, and uh, saw 600 species of birds in, in uh, eight weeks. And, um, but I, the, the thing, one of the things that really stuck with me from that trip was being at a lake in the Andes in the, in the central valley between the two ridges of the Andes in Ecuador. So a lake at 11,000 feet elevation or something in, in August, and there were thousands of Baird sandpipers on their way south. <laughs> and that, of all the things I saw in Ecuador, the, the sorry, Rick, the mannequins, the, <laughs> the, cock, of the cock of the rock, the umbrella bird, the, yeah. the toucans, it was those Baird sandpipers that really stuck with me. And that's, um, 
I have just always been amazed and fascinated by migration and, and just, just, you know, here in Massachusetts, being able to watch it, just to see the birds come and go. It's just um, uh, so exciting and, and so mysterious still, um, how, they, how they find their way and the, the physical feats that some of the birds perform in their migrations is, is also really mind blowing. But that to me, just seeing, seeing a bird actively migrating, um, and even here at our house in, in Massachusetts, just recently, there's been uh, lots of birds still, a few birds still migrating even into December and like flocks of chickadees come flying across the fields, heading south. Um, and they're, they're sort of, it's sort of semi-migration, but uh, eruption. Um, and that, it just, uh, it's just so exciting to me to see birds on the move. Um, that's always the, the behavior that, that is most interesting to me. That's, yeah, that whole idea of the, well, a singular song is amazing in itself. And then birds moving singularly, but in mass, you know, to, to some place and um, is indeed intriguing. So um, next question here, let's, um, let's see. Megan Kenny um, asks, she says, birding is most accessible to able-bodied folks and to those with access to field guides, to the scientific literature and to expert mentors. How do we expand and diversify the demographic of birders to diversify the community and the art and science our communities create? Well, this is really today is uh, three authors talking. So I, I, I'd love to hear your answer to that, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, thanks, Rick. It, it is um, a question really that both of you have kind of answered and it's, uh, it's blurring the lines. It's, um, it's really for us as, as watchers and as scientists um, to really bring the idea of common fate in. I have a mantra, it's same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. And whether you're a bird or a human being, um, we, we all require those, those, those things. And so in thinking about what birds require um, and thinking about what we require and what is often deficit in um, impoverished communities or in communities of color is a lack of clean air, lack of clean water, lack of soil or whole food. So in thinking about the ranges that overlap between birds and human beings. Blurring that line is important to begin to think about empathetic concern for all of us. So canaries in the coal mine, uh, maybe the birds are looking at us as the human beings in some predicament that's going to predict their future. So I think that, that for us to take the science and to be able to break it down um, as, as you have done, Rick, and, and to, to evocatively portray the birds that don't need to be portrayed, but for the access of them, for people, as you both have mentioned, for people to be able to travel around the world in a book, which is what we all did. I wore out the bee encyclopedia, Compton's Brownback. Um, so for me, it's all about bringing us together in ways that create this empathy. Um, and that creates access and for people to understand that the pigeons they watch are as important as the peregrine falcons that they watch. That a murmuration of starlings from afar that's beautiful, um, that despising that bird up close, though I know it creates, it's gonna create some questions among um, some folks there. There's an issue there that we need to resolve. Beauty from afar and um, sort of this despising up close, which has human corollary. So, it's a long answer for a question of love birds um, and, and understand that their fate is our fate. And I think that moves us closer to some area of, of, of common ground, which we're missing right now, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Well said. Okay, uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, got a, we've got a question here. Um, David, did you have, did you have something? I was just going to say that my, you know, I think back on my childhood and how I got interested in birds, obviously having an ornithologist for a father was a big part, but it, it, it was really just exposure. It was getting outdoors and, and at first it wasn't about birds. It was just 
going for a hike and uh, looking at, at nature. And I think that's um, one of the keys of kind of getting, getting kids interested in nature is just exposure and, and a chance to, to see things. And obviously there are a lot of communities where that's more difficult or where there's a lot less, less nature to find. But um, as we've been talking about things like pigeons are, there's a lot of fascinating science and, and biology, a lot of interesting facets to birds like pigeons and house sparrows, um, the things that can be seen anywhere. And it's one of the great things about birds is that they, they're everywhere and, and you can bring them into your, into your life with bird feeders, um, a few shrubs, um, things like that to, uh, to bring birds in. But I think it's um, exposure, just, just getting outdoors and, and looking at all of nature um, with birds as, as a part of that is, uh, um, is really the, uh, the best way to get kids uh, excited about it. Birds fit to every curriculum. I wish that we could somehow fit them into that whole STEM, I rather STEAM sort mm -hmm. of, but they fit, they fit science, they fit, yeah. they fit history. Um, every aspect, art, music, all of it. So I'm all for bird-centered curriculums, abyssentric curriculum, curricula. So here's a big question, simple enough, I want you guys to solve this. Um, address the issue of current climate change and how it is affecting bird migration and the thousands of birds that have died during migration. I'd, I'd like to boil that down and ask what you've seen um, in your lifetimes as, as bird watchers that are sort of indicative of the changes going on environmentally. David? Mm. Well, yeah, it's, um, it's pretty striking in, in my lifetime. I grew up mostly in, in Guilford, Connecticut on the coast, not, not far from New Haven. And, and um, uh, I remember in 1972 or so, when I was just starting birding, um, we, spent half a day on the weekend to drive to someone's house to look for a red-bellied woodpecker that had showed mm. up at their feeder. It was about maybe the fifth or eighth record for the state of Connecticut. And really exciting to see this Southern wanderer. And now red-bellied woodpecker is in every single backyard in Connecticut. If you put up a bird feeder, <laughs> you'll have red-bellied woodpeckers. And, and all the same in Massachusetts and Southern Maine. They have spread several hundred miles north in my lifetime, and a lot of other species have have done something similar. Um, and it's you know these places that I know where where I have sort of fifty years of experience looking at birds, um, the changes are pretty dramatic. Um, spring spring starts a little earlier, fall ends a little later. Um, Birds are wintering farther north. And big changes also just in habitat. Um, there's a lot more forest now, less farmland, less grassland. Yeah, this is in Southern New England. Um, so species like pileated woodpecker are much more numerous now than they were um, 50 years ago. Uh, species like meadowlarks and kestrels are almost gone. Um, and it's, uh, it's a lot of different factors sort of um, intertwining, but, um, but, but big, big changes. Yeah, I, I, I you know, uh, David and I started birding at the same time in, in both in New England. So we had a lot of common experience. And I, you know, I already mentioned the evening grosbeak becoming rare when it was a really quite a common bird in New England, northern New England anyway, when, as when I was a kid. Um, one thing that's, that, that David did mention is raptors. Uh, when I was a kid, I would go to sleep pining to see hawks, you know, because they were, there were just weren't a lot of them. And, uh, you know, even red tail was like, you know, you could bird in the, in, in New, you know, Southern New England in the summer for a day and not see a red tail, right? It, it was, of course, DDT. And, uh, 
now these uh, the, 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 the expansion, except for Kestrel, but of, of, of Peregrine and Merlin and, uh, and, and, uh, and all the other raptors in North America is really uh, spectacular. But yes, it's a, um, it's a global issue. Um, I've been in field sites uh, in, in the Amazon 20 years later that were turned into small cities. And uh, uh, this is happening at quite, um, quite, a, quite a, an alarming rate around the world. All right, for Ryu Rick, here's a question from Marielle. When it comes to the evolution of beauty, you provided thought as to what this could mean for inclusion of different human populations and beauty standards. Could the emphasis of the evolution of beauty be an easier entryway to relate to birds from an aesthetic standpoint for humans? And then for David, would the evolution of birds lead to any changes or modifications in the aesthetic depictions or verbal descriptions of birds in your guides? What about the vocabulary that's used? So, um, Rick, um, you know, blur, um, blur the line question. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, talking about human beauty is a is a complicated question and not one you could do quickly on the fly. So last four chapters of the evolution of beauty are about people where you can lay it out in a, in a responsible way, but uh, you know, we're as complicated as they come, uh, all sorts of mechanisms of sele sexual selection and natural selection. And then on top of that, you have culture. So uh, humans are complicated, uh, are, we're complicated. And of course that makes us uh, fascinating uh, and unique. So uh, I, I can't dive in in this amount of time any deeper than that. <laughs> Uh, pitch it to David. David, <laughs> how about um, different portrayals of birds or descriptions in your in your guides? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, uh, I, I think you know this question of 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 changes or modifications in 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 birds. Well, so for example, naming, even mm -hmm. you know think about naming birds and sort of the conventions that we have for naming birds. Um, some of us still refer to harriers as marsh hawks just because we're all <laughs> sort of fuddy duddies. But I also think about colloquialisms for birds. I think about um, perhaps the perceptions of different cultures for birds. So First Nations names for, or First Nations uh, names for birds, those kinds of cultural guides for birds maybe. Have you thought about any of, of that kind of, of move? Yeah, yeah, there's, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, I can only really come at the, the field guide from my own perspective. And um, uh, I think there's, it is, um, even though I'm, I'm trying to illustrate the birds as they are, but it's really it's as I see them. Um, so in that sense, I guess there's there's lots of room for another for other interpretations, other field guides, um, other um, other perspectives on the birds. And I um, I've thought I have thought a lot about those questions, but um, it's. Um, it's really, I always come back to just, I can only write and illustrate what I, what I know, what I've experienced. And um, it's, it's my own personal perspective on the birds. Um, yes, as, uh, as Rick talked about collaboration, uh, <laughs> uh, David, I, I would love to talk to you about that. I, it brings to mind a, a conversation I had um, with a Maasai student at one time, Eric Rayson, who was doing research on vultures. And it was amazing when he talked about Maasai perceptions of birds, even the birds that young boys could touch, but older men could not. Um, and, and how those birds had, of course, different names, but even the vultures, um, you know, a, a lappet faced vulture um, versus, um, an Egyptian vulture and, and sort of these different perceptions that people had of them um, that never appears in any field guide. So I think that's part of where that question is going. And you're right. Yeah. Um, it's the perceptions of the writer um, here that, that come through, of course. Yeah. So, oh, that's fascinating and, and very uh, worth, worth, in, worth investigating, worth pursuing. 
So here's a question. Um, someone asked how long you two have known one another and um, have you have you had some, do you have any birding trip stories? That we have know? never been birding as far as I remember. Oh. It's always in these kind of academical <laughs> or, you know, context like this that we, that we yeah. run into each other, but we should have. Uh, and uh, yeah. I, uh, let's see, let's go to Bolivia, David. What do you say? Free, okay. uh, as soon as we get vaccines? <laughs> okay, I'm in. <laughs> I'm on, yeah, let's go. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna find a way and I'll invite both of you when it's safe to South Carolina um, and we'll spend some time in the low country. And uh, yeah, I, I know a place. So <laughs> we'll, we'll take a look at, at, some, at some birds. Um, Fantastic. Let's see here. Another question from. Uh, this could be the last one, and then I'm going to pop in to give our conclusion. Um, all so right, we'll, all right. We would have to so we'll we'll stick with this one. Karen Clark asks. Uh, she says, "Thank you for to all of us." And she says, "What books on birds do you own that are your personal favorites, or what bird book do you wish someone would write?" that you keep waiting for? It's a great question for writers. Mm. <laughs> uh, one book that really influenced me uh, was a book by a British ornithologist named David Snow. And it's called The Web of Adaptation. It's from the 70s. And it was an early work in avian ecology uh, or and uh, behavioral ecology, I guess you'd say, breeding biology. Um, and um, it introduced me to the whole idea of evolutionary ecology and breeding systems. And it, he worked a lot on mannequins. Of course, it was, it was a real inspiration um, to me. And uh, it was a beautiful book and very funny. Uh, it was a great book. Awesome. David? Um, I would say that the um, books written by George Mitch Sutton, um, an ornithologist from the early 1900s, mid 1900s, who um, he he was a very good writer, a very good storyteller, and he wrote stories, very personal stories about his own experiences. And and um, as a kid, I really enjoyed those stories. They're from a different time. A Out different, of Bend uh, in a Mexican River, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, there's another one. I'm blanking on the name. It is a fantastic story of him as a as a young kid being interested in nature and, and finding a turkey vulture nest uh, mm. on his family's farm in Oklahoma and um, as I said it's from a different a different era so you have to read it from the perspective of a uh, early 1900s uh, kid but anyway it, that's I, I love those stories his writing um, very knowledgeable and, and very personable, but the, the book that changed my life is a book by Lars Johnson, The Birds of Europe. His is an illustrator um, who wrote, wrote and illustrated a field guide to the birds of Europe. And um, his illustrations just uh, are amazing. And um, really when I discovered his work in the early 1980s, um, it, uh, uh, like I said, it changed <laughs> changed my life. It was something that I really aspired to. Um, his illustrations are just so so beautiful, so lifelike, so delicate, um, and uh, so I highly recommend looking up both of those books. Well, for me, it's J. A. Baker's *The Peregrine*, the depth of the book. Um, it's it's the definition of obsession with a bird, with a species, but and a landscape. But I'd like to thank you both um, as we give it back over to Jillian. Thank you both Rick and David for being so gracious in your knowledge that you, you give freely to those of us who love birds and, and anyone who will look up um, to wonder at their flight. So thank you all for, for being here with us tonight and uh, with the three bird brains and um, hopefully we'll see you when it's safe to do so out there on the, on the birding trail. Take care everyone. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Thank you so much, Drew. This has been such an illuminating, thought-provoking, informative discussion, and it's perfect for this early December Wednesday evening. Thank you to everyone watching. You've been a great audience. Just as a reminder, you can find the full catalogs um, for both the speakers here tonight and much more at Penguin Random House's website. You can also find Drew's titles at Milkweed Press's website. Um, the event tonight was part of an ongoing series at Canop Doubleday called Two Writers Talking, which pairs brilliant writers together to talk about anything 
from birding to historical adventures to debut novels. You can keep up to date on these events by visiting Double Day's Eventbrite page. Thank you everyone so much for your time. Um, this is like such a lively question and answer box, such a lively conversation. Um, I'm just absolutely thrilled to have all of your time tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.